I simply ask you, Doug and Katie, as you join together, and Reese, hey, we're going for one. We had a, uh, we have opportunity to just simply share together as a church in a wonderful moment. So I simply ask you both as parents, are you uh, committed in your relationship to Christ and his church? Will you raise Reese in a Christian home and teach her about the love of Jesus and about faith and the joys of faith in her life? Kneel right here for a moment. Can you do that with her? Yeah, can you do it? We have the water before us this morning to remind us all of purity and the cleansing and forgiveness of our sins. And also, even when you came in this morning, if you came in the center door, there's a font there with water that we oftentimes uh, use to remind us of our baptism when we come into the service. It's there for us to dip our hands into and simply uh, remember our baptism and the water and the wetness of it. And we do things like a cross on the forehead or just on our hand with the water. A tangible reminder of God's presence and mercy and grace. And on this day, I ask you to remember your own baptism and that you are a child of God. And to remember your baptism and that you are a child of God. And we get to do something extra special, a sacrament of the church. And Reese, if you'd come with me without crying. <laughs> And I'm going to step back here just like this for everybody with mom and dad. Tracy, thank you. And I get to say and share these words. Reese, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit on this day. Amen. Amen. Now, at this time, if uh, Holly, if you and Andrew would come forward, and also I believe Brandon's going to come as well. We have Brother Eli Fender. Eli and I have already been talking about all this stuff he's going to do right now, and he is thankfully proud to be able to do this. Come over here. Mom, if you'd come over here. Brandon, you can sit right there. Or you can't do this way. All right, I ask you all, if you will be loyal to the church and help bring Eli up in the understanding of God's love for him and help him to grow in that understanding. Okay, come on. And Eli, you're big enough, buddy, to answer this on your own. Do you want Jesus in your life to be your Lord and Savior? Do you love Jesus and want to follow him throughout your life and grow in your understanding of Jesus? I'm going to ask us to do this, and I'm going to ask you, if you would, to remember your baptism and that you are a child of God. Remember your baptism and that you are a child of God. Remember your baptism and that you are a child of God. And Eli, we're going to go back here again and do this with Eli. Eli, we don't use a lot of water oftentimes in the Methodist church. But you're old enough, you're going to fill this water on your head. Because <laughs> I'm going to put some on your head, and it's going to run down your back, and you're going to feel this chill. And I pray that always, when you think about how much God loves you, you'll remember this moment and have that woo, funny feeling about God's presence, okay, in a great way. And everybody's watching your face when it happens. <laughs> Eli, I baptize you. Today, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Y'all stand right over here. It's all good. Y'all just stand right there for a moment. Thank you, Tracy. Our congregation has some words that are going to come up on the screen. And as 
a congregation, I'm going to ask that if you would just share these words uh, as we welcome both in, to our families. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. Keep your day job. Hey, I want you to check this little video out. It might remind some of you of days gone by, but it's really not that old. It may remind you, though, of some days in your life when you felt especially brave or you wanted to be brave and you wanted to do something in your life and you finally just did it. One day, it became too much for Michael Squint's turn, turn it up. I can't take this no more. Move! And he did the most desperate thing any of us had ever seen. What he'd done was sneaky, rotten, and low, and cool. Not another one among us would have ever in a million years, even for a million dollars, had the guts to put the move on the lifeguard. He did. He had kissed a woman, and he had kissed her long and good. We got banned from the pool forever that day, but every time we walked by after that, the lifeguard looked down from her tower, right over at Squints, and smiled.
It is one of those things when you're growing up that you always want to do is kiss the lifeguard. My wife was a lifeguard, and I ended up marrying her, so that tells you something right there. But it is so cool that Squints had this in his mind, and the guy said, did you plan this? And he said, I've been planning it a long time. He had been planning this for a long time to be brave enough to step forward and make this happen. We've been doing our sermon series on We Are. Last week was We Are Real. And over at the 845 and at the 11, I gave some things about being real in my own life, a few things back from the day, one when I was probably 12, another when I may have been 14, about different times in life when I had made mistakes, where I had done things intentionally even that were mistakes. But I told the uh, bypass campus group that I couldn't give them too much ammunition. That was like three weeks ago. I gave them, you know, 35 years ago. I did so and so. But it's an amazing thing when we look at this we are and we are real and what it means to be real. And here today, our series continues, we are brave and what it means to be brave. Some of our words are from Joshua, familiar words, I hope, from Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 that are going to magically appear on the screen right now. Right now. After, <laughs> I was hoping they'd lose the green. <laughs> At least give us some pink. After the death of Moses, remember that, Joshua was Moses' assistant, and now it's all about Joshua, in a sense. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, Moses died, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, Moses is now dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River and to the land that I am giving them. I promise you, or I promise you what I promised Moses. Whatever you set, wherever you set your foot, you will be on the land I've given you, from the Negva wilderness to the south, to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess the land I swore to them, uh, or swore to their ancestors that I would give them. Be strong again and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them turning either to the right or the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This again is my commandment that God keeps emphasizing to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And that was God's word to Joshua. That was God's word, if you look back, even in the book of Exodus, that was God's word to Moses. Moses, I will be with you. Even when Moses started out saying, but Lord, I don't speak well. And Lord, I don't know how to exercise authority in this kind of way. And I'm afraid. What if they ask me, who sent me here? And God simply said, you tell them I am sent you. You tell them those words, and you stand there brave. And Moses still kind of got scared and held back, and he said, okay, I'm going to send Aaron with you. And then Miriam went with them in addition to Aaron. And so as they were traveling, Moses had companions with him along the way. I remember many of my companions growing up. We were like one another. I love that word in the Bible, and we're going to do a series on it one day called one another. And me and my buddies, we were like one another. We loved one another. We traveled with one another. We hung out with each other. We, it was always about one another. We didn't like to do anything kind of alone, really. We were always together. And we were out one day being brave, and we went out on this catamaran. Not many of us actually knew much about the catamaran. There were three guys and three girls. And we went out on this catamaran. I'd never been out on a catamaran, but I 
took control as I was being brave and I grabbed hold of the rope like I had seen on TV and I was hanging off the side of the catamaran when it, you know, cocked up in the air. My buddy was driving and I was hanging off the side thinking, you know, this has got to be good. This has got to look good with all my abs showing and my arms and my muscles and why are y'all laughing and, and, and all of that. And it's better than... <laughs> John, at the early service over at the Bypass campus, spoke up and laughed and said, I want to see pictures. And Fran hollered out, there are no pictures <laughs> of that. Um, but I just knew I could do this. I could dip down in the water like they did on TV. And I did dip down, and that wave about three feet high caught my hip and just knocked me off of the catamaran. But I held on for dear life to the rope, and I was being drugged through the water by the rope and I was having the greatest of time for just a moment. And then I realized from my fishing experience that I was bait out in the ocean for all types of problems, you're right, and situations. It, you could barely see the land from where we were, but I knew, uh, you know, how am I going to do this? And I was trying to be brave and thinking I could pull myself up to the boat, but that wasn't working because then my pants started falling off. And I was holding on to the rope, wrapped with one arm, holding on to my pants down to here with the other. And I made the decision. Which one do you think I let go of? <laughs> the rope. <laughs> and when I did, I was out in the ocean. No joke. <laughs> Deep. And I remembered. Dun -dun 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 -dun. <laughs> You're right. You are shark bait for sure. You don't stop a catamaran on a dime and turn around. You've got to sail around and come back up behind. And I just knew I was lost because sometimes in the waves I could not see the catamaran. But they came back and they got me. And I never went back out again on a catamaran. Never. I'm not necessarily scared of it, but I just won't hang off of it next time. And I'll have someone that can drive it a little bit better. And I'm not as brave when it comes to that as I would like to be. But I look at that word bravery, and I think about it in our lives as Christians and in Joshua's life. There were times in Moses' life, remember, Moses was the man, and then Joshua was the assistant, and then Joshua took over. But there were times when Moses was brave without question, even though he had to have Aaron and then Miriam and others to help him, including Joshua and many others, actually. But Moses was brave and courageous, if you can put those two words, combining them together. And Moses was moving forward on all turns, but Moses also had some times when he was frustrated. Moses had times when he was aggravated. Moses had times when he became angry even, and God fussed at him. Moses had a lot of problems when it came to the people. He would say to God, God, these are your people. When are you going to correct them? I am tired of their complaining and their griping and their moaning and their groaning. And then he and God would have these conversations. And then God uh, had these same conversations with Joshua. Joshua was always like, let's charge forward. Let's move ahead. And the same thing with Moses. Moses, tell the people to stop whining, God would say and move forward, and to be brave, and to be courageous. But there were times when they couldn't find that bravery. There were times when they could not be courageous. And perhaps there are times like that in our own lives, times that we can't be brave, and times that we can't be courageous. I think of uh, those times in our lives when terrible things come our way. doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care for us. There are times in our lives when it seems like everything goes wrong. There are times in our lives when it seems like everything around us just goes backwards. And I think of sometimes in our lives when we ask people, and I just happened to make this little card this morning, and we ask them, is there anything wrong in your life? Anything wrong? And people will oftentimes simply say, no, there's nothing wrong. Everything's cool. Everything's fine. Everything's going well. And then we oftentimes end up in actuality listening to them for a little while and we'll find out that everything's wrong. There's all types of problems and all types of difficulty because sometimes we don't like to 
share our hurts, our pains, our sorrows. We don't like to share the storm that we might be going through in life and that difficulty and that hardship. But God says to us that I am with you, we're told in the book of Romans, and that anything that comes your way, I'm with you. You are not alone. Anything that comes your way, you are not alone. And God comes forward and he tells us, remember this, that everything that goes on in your life, I want you to have under my control. I want you to bring it to me, not carry it around. Every burden, every problem, every difficulty, every hardship, everything. Now, sometimes have you ever truthfully just thrown your hands up in the air and say, dang, what else could happen? Everything seems to be going wrong. And it can be literally everything because it all mounts up and piles up on us. And then we come to a book like the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8. And he says, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember that everything is under God's care. That there's nothing that comes against you. No thing. Nothing. There's no thing that comes against you that God is not involved in. The Apostle Paul in Romans 8 reminds us in that passage, what can separators from the love of God? Shall famine? Shall uh, loss of everything we own? Nakedness? Shall uh, destitution? He just names all of it. Shall perils? Shall sword? Anything. He says, no, nothing comes against us that Christ can't be involved in our lives. But he wants us to bathe ourselves in his presence. That song that the uh, band sang a few moments ago, Awake, Awake, My Soul, uh, is about God breathing in to dry bones and awaking our soul. There's a time in our lives, I, I was even tapping my chest when that song was there because I want to awaken myself, arouse myself by saying, wake up, Carl. Hear the voice of God. Hear the call of God on your life. Breathe in the call of God because that's what um, our word about being brave is all about. He's not saying, Joshua, you've got abs. And Joshua, you've got a spear. And Joshua, you've got a shield. He's saying, Joshua, I am your spear. I am your sword. I am your vest. I am that plate of righteousness that you're going to wear. Joshua, I am is breathing new life into you. And when I call you, that's what I'm doing. There was a time in my own life when I experienced a number of problems and almost tragedies. Many of us have some wreck, some situation that we've been in. I was literally buried alive once in a, uh, an, a working accident. I was 10 feet underground, the sides caved in, and I was buried there for several hours. Couldn't move, just stuck in the bottom of a hole. And they dug me out and dug me out. It was a big ordeal. And I remember to this day, I'm still somewhat claustrophobic, but I remember to this day, even then, and I was young, but I remember being in the bottom of that 10-foot hole, crying, cursing, praying. Crying, cursing, praying. Crying, cursing, praying, because I knew for sure I was not going to be around anymore. This was it. And it's amazing when you have that moment in your life, the things you think about and the things that come to mind and before you. And I was just in a wild moment. I could barely even catch a breath. I was filling my lungs with dirt every time I breathed in. And now, as I look back on that incident, and that accident in my life, I realize that that's probably not the best thing to do <laughs> when you're about to meet your maker is to be crying, cursing, and praying. At least it's nice to have all of those mixed together because I know that that was a moment when I was caught up in fear. Now, I'm not saying fear is always a bad thing. If you're in a, in a room with a rattlesnake, be careful. Fear can fight or flight, <laughs> you know, you've got one of two choices to make there. But I am saying this, that that moment I was afraid. I was afraid of dying. I was afraid of death. I was afraid of 
where I was in my relationship with the Lord, and I was also in a panic. But looking back on that, and even shortly thereafter it, I was able to see that God did something wonderful there. Even in the midst of our panic, God is with us, and He passionately loves on us. Even those moments in our lives when we feel like we're broken because everything in life goes wrong, God is there saying, hey, I want to breathe new life into you. I want to breathe new life into your work. I want to breathe new life into your marriage. I want to breathe new life into your relationships with your children and family. I want to fix whatever might be broken or is frail and fragile in your faith or in your life. And that's the way God loves us. And that's the way God reaches out to us and cares for us. He wants to awaken our soul and breathe new life into us. And one way he does that for us today is right through this meal that we share, this time of communion. And we hear the words even as we gather on this day anew and afresh, the body and blood of Christ broken and shed for you and for me. And how in hearing that, if those who are assisting would come forward, that Jesus took that bread and he broke it and he presented it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. And he also took the cup that night following the meal and he said, take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me, he says. Let us pray. Almighty God, in remembrance of your mighty acts, we give thanks and praise for your giving of yourself to each one of us. And may this bread and wine on this day remind us of your great love for us. Breathe upon us all fresh and new, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.